and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. All right, well, we are once again in the middle of the summer. Once again, all sorts of cool things are happening. Once again, we are prepping for Gen Con. A couple of things, I don't want to talk too much about Gen Con because that's next week, but I will say this. If you are coming to Gen Con and want to see our live show, make sure you sign up for that. You can go online, check out the Gen Con events, look for Dice Tower Live Show. It's Friday, 2 o'clock. Um, I'm also doing a panel on Thursday if you want to come to that. So those are different shows that you can check out. Other than that, um, if you backed our uh, Kickstarter this year and did so for the Gloomhaven scenario, uh, that will be, you have that. You should have it. Go check your pledge manager. And if you don't have it, please let us know at support at dicetower.com. But you should have it by now. Um, and everything else for the Kickstarter is being packed up and get, gotten together and should be shipping out in August or September. All right, well, with that being said, there's a lot of news this week, so let's get to it. Okay, so first in the news we have, we mentioned last week how Zool, uh, they announced that they had sold 320,000 copies of it. Well, now there's a, a sequel to it coming out called Azul Stained Glass of Sintra. This is a city in Portugal, uh, resort-type town, and stained glass. So the, the first one was tiling. This one's stained glass. I find stained glass much more interesting. Uh, the, the, the stuff looks gorgeous. It looks very similar to um, Azul, but it also seems like there's some differences in the mechanisms. The base mechanism where you draw tiles looks the same. The other stuff looks different. We'll find out. I'm sure it will be a smashing success. Uh, for Star Wars Legion, the Emperor and Royal Guards will be released from Fantasy Flight. Of course, they're going to have every single figure eventually. I don't remember the Emperor going out leading troops in battle, but maybe it happened in one of the books or something. Heaven and Ale, very popular game uh, from Eggert Spiel, has announced there will be an expansion. But don't get too excited because you have to wait till 2019. We'll find out more about the expansion probably as time goes by. Now, dinosaurs are all the rage right now because of Jurassic World 2, and uh, Mondo has announced a game based on Jurassic Park, a Jurassic Park game, Chaos Gene. In this, you can play one of four factions. You can be the T-Rex. That sounds fun. The Raptors. That sounds fun. The in-gen guys trying to keep everything going from going out of control. That sounds fun. And the visitors. Well, that sounds scary. Um, it looks like there's miniatures and things coming for each of them. So this, I don't know, this is the third dinosaur game um, and the second about Jurassic Park in just a few months. So this is a hot theme probably of this year. Game Right has announced Sneaky Cards 2. I think this will be at Gen Con, actually. Sneaky Cards 2 uh, is... Sneaky Cards was basically just a deck of cards and be like, have a celebrity sign this or whatever. They would have all kinds of, you know, give this to somebody who's wearing a funny hat. And then you give the card to that person. And then that person gives it to somebody else, but every time you get a card, you like register it somewhere so you can see where your cards go around the world. Fallout. Now, Fallout, the board game, was not a smash success for uh, us here at the Dice Tower, but it seems to be selling really well, and a lot of people do like it. So there's a new expansion coming for it, New California. More stuff for it, and I would not be surprised if we see this at Gen Con, but otherwise it's coming out in just a few months. Astra is the American Specialty Toy Retailing Association. Uh, and they've announced their Best Toy Awards. And so for Best uh, best Game Night is a game called Itzy, uh, where you basically, it's like a party game where you're making up words, but you can only use the letters in front of you. Their Best Game for Under 7 is Gnomes at Night. Um, this is a, a cooperative game, I think. And uh, Their Best Logic Toy was Turing Tumble, which we reviewed here and is amazing. Their best strategy game, Photosynthesis. And their best game for seven and older is Forbidden Skies. This one has me kind of going, huh? How are all these retailers voting on Forbidden Skies when the game isn't even out and no one even knows how it plays yet? I guess that shows the power of the Forbidden Desert, Forbidden Island thing. Go figure. Winning an award before you're released. All right, IDW has announced Sonic Dice Rush. Uh, IDW's been doing a lot of uh, these uh, um, 
you know, IP type things. This one looks like it's based on maybe the more app, you know, the app games of Sonic Speed and stuff like that. Plaid Hat. Now, Plaid Hat's all, they just, we got, last week I announced the game they, they were releasing. Here's another one, Neon Gods. Also from Isaac Vega, who seems to be their main designer right now. This game is based in 2009 from the viewpoint of the 70s and 80s. And you're doing your different rival gangs. The neon part is definitely the case here. The game is very neon and she brightly colored. I'm sure we'll find out more as it goes by. It looks similar to one of their earlier games that they did that also had gangs, but we'll have to wait and see. Villainous is really making the rounds uh, with, uh, I guess, excitement. This one's coming out like in a few days. And this is from Wonderforge. This is a game in which you play one of the Disney villains. So you can be Jafar or um, Ursula or something like that. And then you're fighting against the other Disney villains. I'm sure a lot of people will get a real kick out of that. Is Scar in the game? Because that's who I'd want to be. Be prepared. All right. Star Wars Destiny Across the Galaxy. This is a new expansion for the Star Wars Destiny. And this one's based on the movie Solo. So if you like that movie or you want to see a bunch of that stuff, it's in this game. And finally... the. Me and Z were just talking about this a few weeks ago uh, where uh, I said, you know what? It's been 10 years since Pandemic came out. I'm surprised they haven't done a Pandemic 10th Anniversary Edition. Well, lo and behold, they are. Uh, the Pandemic 10th Anniversary Edition, uh, this is going to be have new art, new everything, right? New art. It's, they're going to go back to wooden components. They're going to have miniatures for the characters. It comes in a, like a little carrying case, like you know the picture here. You can see that. It's going to weigh six pounds, and it's going to cost one hundred dollars. That's pretty expensive. It reminds me very similarly of the Ticket to Ride uh, Anniversary Edition. So everything's going to be bigger, bigger board and stuff. So big, you know, fans of Pandemic rejoice. They do not say if any expansions are included. I'm going to assume no for now, because because they don't say that they're included. Um, but it still seems like a hefty price tag, but maybe the thing looks really gorgeous when it's laid out on the table. We'll find out. But they, I think they're going to be showing us off uh, a copy of it at Gen Con. So we'll let you know more as we see it then. All right. Well, that is the regular news. Let's jump to Kickstarter. Happy breakfast, everybody. As the gaming world winds up to Gen Con next week, I think it's interesting to see what companies decide that this is the right window for their campaign as all the Gen Con campaign activities are going on. Is it a marketing boost or a marketing hindrance? Well, at least a few companies thought it was worth the risk because I've got some fun stuff to take a look at right now. Trogdor is a cooperative game for two to six players in which you're trying to help the titular dragon burn down the countryside. Based on the hugely popular Homestar Runner web series, Trogdor was designed by the brothers Chaps and James Ernest of Cheap Ass Games, giving it a little extra nudge of game design cred. Players take on the role of keepers of Trogdor who will use their actions to help burninate through the tiles. Card play dictates the action points and special abilities as players move, burn tiles, devour or burn peasants, or even hide. Enemies like knights and archers and peasants are controlled by a separate deck, and the whole game features a ton of good humor. This campaign offers two versions of the game. The Wingling level includes custom printed meeples, while the Burninator level adds in molded plastic minis with a clever flippable cottage piece. You can get the Trogdor Wingling version for $40 plus shipping, or the Burninator level for $60 plus shipping. Nanami is a terrain control game for two players in which players are seeking to influence yet coexist. Designed by an Inuit from the far north, Nanami is inspired by the balance of humans and nature, and it features triangular cards that are placed in hexagonal area base pieces. Players take turns placing and flipping cards in order to influence each area. You'll tally areas when a base is filled and then score points based on hitting a specific strength target based on your player color or by having a majority of the hex in your color. Nanami has sleek modern abstract art and while this is the designer's first game and publishing attempt, the project is compelling as an abstract two-player game and it's worth a look. You can get a copy of Nanami for a pledge of 45 Canadian dollars plus shipping, although at the time of this recording there were early bird levels still available. 
Another new design and publishing team is bringing us Tiny Trees. With shades of the tree spirit game Kudama from Indie Boards and Cards, Tiny Trees differentiates itself by having a three-dimensional presentation with hexagonal cards being added to a trunk to grow your game structure. Blessing cards change the rules of the standard gameplay and they get mixed up, offering different challenges each game. And you'll score points through branches by scoring points for the most plentiful bark type along the way, life forms like birds, bugs, and fungus, and finally, those blessing cards also set end game goals for points too. Interestingly, the makers actually note that they worked to exclude destruction elements in the game so that players don't have to worry about their tree creation being ruined. Tiny Trees is cute and simple, and it offers a deluxe laser cut cardboard edition, but a basic cardstock version of Tiny Trees takes a pledge of $33 plus shipping. In Escape Plan, designed by Vital Lacerda, players are former members of a bank robbing team, but now you're all on your own trying to get out of the city before it gets locked down by the cops. On your way out, you have three days to find your escape route and to collect as much of the hidden loot as you can, and if you get caught by the cops, you get nothing. Throughout the game, you're plotting your moves, which includes influencing the cops. You'll move around, hire gangs to create diversions, and visit stores to buy equipment and open lockers. As you continue, your notoriety will increase and you'll get new abilities, but you'll also draw more attention from the cops, so you can try to push them towards your former gang members instead. Escape Plan features deluxe quality pieces and really stylish art by the ever-talented Ian O'Toole, and it's been praised as one of Lacerda's more accessible games, providing depth with a little less complexity. A copy of Escape Plan takes a pledge of $79 plus shipping. And last but not least, SPQF is a streamlined deck builder for 2-4 players designed by Grant Rodiak, best known for Cry Havoc. SPQF subverts some elements of deck building like card cost, and the cards are multi-use. As you work to gather resources and build up your civilization, you'll draft cards to enhance your deck and play cards that can be used for their actions, used to strengthen other actions, or used to follow an opponent's action. Then, in another twist, any unused cards in your hand on your turn, well, they get put out for other players to potentially draft from later. Monuments randomly assigned at the beginning can provide extra endgame points, and SPQF features charming anthropomorphic animal art that's reminiscent of older Disney films. Films. SPQF includes a bunch of custom etched wood pieces, and you can get a copy for $49 plus shipping. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hey there, everyone. I'm Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with this week's segment from the page to the table. This week, I'm going to look at a book which is so hard to take away from the iconic movie franchise that spawned after it. And that would be The Godfather by Mario Puzo. This is one of those movies that I think people sometimes forget was based on a book and a book that's pretty solid too. I did this a couple of years ago for my classics book club in the summertime and of course I heard, well, why is this a classic? Well, it's a classic because it's definitive of the genre. It's this great pulpy mafia fiction book with lots of crime and intrigue, family drama, and that had such great source material to spawn such a wonderful franchise. Um, I, I think it, for some people, it's one of their favorite books and movies of all time, and I can totally see why. There's lots of things and games out there that are based on the Godfather universe, but my favorite, and it's one of my favorite games, is The Godfather, Corleone's Empire, designed by Eric M. Lang and published by Simon Limited. Two to five players, uh, 60 minutes plus, depending on how many people you have, 14 and up. So there's a lot that goes on just besides the whole franchise. So we have where you're trying to do a lot of jobs and do a lot of area control, which is essentially what this book is about. It's all about spreading out your empire and having the most power, which is what this game is, the heart of this game really is too. Uh, I think there's 
a lot of things that one can love about this besides the area control. It's super thematic with uh, the jobs that you're trying to do, the collecting of different resources, and you know the crime and the crime that's going on here is definitely seen in this game as well. Godfather was one of my favorite games of 2017. What was one of yours from 2017? That's all for this week. Happy gaming. I'll see you on Instagram. Greetings and welcome to the Mega Meeple. I am Thomas Grogan and I need your help. I know I need help, but that's beside the point. No, I need your help. Now, I've, I'm kind of new compared to other people in the board gaming community. Uh, I've only been playing board games for, what, about three, three and a half years. I've only been doing my podcast a little over a year. And I've only been doing this for, what, two months, three, maybe? I, I lost count. But anyway, I have had recently uh, two designers send me their game and ask me to do a review of them. Now, this is where you come in. I need your help. What do you look for in a game review? I mean, I, I've seen a lot of other people uh, do like uh, game reviews where they go over how the game plays and how do you play the game. Oh, in that case, is it really a review or just a, a how to play video? I mean, do you want to see ratings of the art or the components or the rule book or the mechanics or how it plays? Do you want to hear what my personal experience of how that game made me feel? Uh, what do you want to see in a, a game review that would be beneficial and helpful to you as a gaming uh, consumer? So, sound off in the comments down below. Help a guy out! And thank you so much in advance for your advice and suggestions. Skies Above the Reich is a solo game where it puts you in charge of German fighters trying to knock out American bombers from destroying German cities. It comes with a basic game and an advanced game. In the basic game, either you blow up one of the bombers in the formation or you knock them out. That's it. In the advanced game, either blow up one of the bombers in the formation or you knock them out and then you chase the guy. In this game, you have a couple of maps. You got the big picture map where you see all the American bombers. You send your German planes to take out these bombers. Once one of the bombers is out of formation, you go to a smaller, more detailed map and that's where you start doing damage to the plane or the plane does damage to you. You can actually start playing this game without even reading the rule book. Take your handy dandy player aid. When you come to a problem, stop, go to the rule book, read that section, keep going. Skies Above the Reich, medium in complexity, published by GMT. Flying Pig Games, Rangers at Point Zuck. This game is not out yet, it's a Kickstarter, and it kickstarts July 24th, noon, Eastern Daylight Time. So this is a solitary game where you play the Rangers getting off on Normandy, attacking the Germans, trying to climb 100 foot cliffs to try to take out a gun that's taking out your buddies out there at sea. This is a push your luck type mechanic where you roll a die and things happen. Like German counteroffensive. You're out of ammunition, bombardment from the Germans. And all this is happening while you're trying to survive and you're trying to get to those cliffs about what, 100 yards away? Bad things are gonna happen. So, you know, you gotta make good things happen. You know, this, this ain't frou-frou goes to Namby Pamby land. It's a war game. Uh, July 24th at noon, when the Kickstarter kicks off, it's gonna give the first few players the game for a buck. Plus, the stretch goals. So for you Euro gamers on the fence trying to cross over, this is a great game. Crowbar, points up, designed by Herman Lutman. Thanks for watching, and if you wanna know more about war games, watch my channel, no enemies here. Thank you. Okay, so from the Dice Tower this week, you're gonna see a few live things. I'll be doing a live Q&A today, but also we have scheduled this week where I'll be doing a live um, preview of Gen Con, where I'm gonna be going through the, the Gen Con uh, list of games that's on Board Game Geek and just talking about my opinions and things like that. So I'll just be kind of going through that. Also, you'll see, you saw our top 10 anticipated games from Gen Con that we haven't played. I'll also be doing a list this week of top 15 games that you should check out at Gen Con that I have played. I will be uh, taking a, uh, Sam's going to be taking a look at top 10 
games you should uh, look at the demo versions of. I think Z is doing expansions. So a lot of pre-Gen Con coverage, but there's also going to be many different reviews put up this week. One that I'm really excited about. I'll be doing a couple reviews on the Rise of Fenris expansion for Scythe. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I guess I'm kind of tipping my hand here because of, um, I'm pretty excited about the review, but you'll want to check those out. And of course, the podcast, Dice Tower podcast going up this week is me, Eric, Suzanne, and Mandy. And again, it's a pre-Gen Con show where we talk about the different games and answer questions about Gen Con. Of course, that's not it. As usual, I want to point out that the Dice Tower is not just video. We have a podcast, like I just mentioned. And there are many other podcasts in the Dice Tower Network. You can find out all their great shows at DiceTowerNetwork.com. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plates. And today on Apply Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Gong Shun Clever. So this is a roll and write game where you have a lot of combos along with tough decisions. So let me show you a little bit about this game and why I really like it. Depending on the number of players, you will play a certain number of rounds. On the first round, you'll obtain a free re-roll. The active player will roll their dice. They can use their free reroll in case they don't like their outcome. The active player will be able to pick up any one of these dice. If they pick this die, then any value below that will be offered to all other players at the end of their turn. Depending on the color of the die that they took, then they will have to mark off in that area. The active player will then reroll all of the dice that are left over. The active player will be able to take up to three dice, always marking off what they took. The non-active players will be able to pick and choose from the dice that are left over. The white die is a wild, and it represents any color. Taking certain value dice may even lead to combos in the game. If you were to take this value 6, then you could potentially mark off this box, which will then lead you to mark off any blue value box. In that case, you might be able to make even more combos along the way. You add up your points for every region, and the player with the most points wins. So as you can see, there are a bunch of tough decisions in this game. You're picking a die, but not only that, you're also potentially offering other dice for players to take. You can't totally depend on the roll of the dice. You also have to depend on those combos. And linking from one place to another is what's going to help you fill out your sheet. You also have other helpful things like re-rolls, and other added dice to pick up along with that white die. There's so much variability in this game that every game is different. And that's why I really enjoy Gonshan Clever. Well, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye! Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Brookline Plumbing. Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering if you had an opening today to come check out a, a bit of a leak I got going on here? Oh man, yeah, I got a lot of clients. I'm real busy today. So I'm gonna need you just to kind of keep your schedule open from 8 a.m. till, you know, 9 p.m. tonight. See, that's like the only times you can come. It's a pretty bad leak. I mean, uh, is there any way you can, you can narrow it down at all? Look, nah, man, I wish I could, but I'm uh, I'm real busy. Real got a lot of uh, a lot of big leaks today, so can't do that. You're gonna be all right though. You're not in any kind of rush. Okay, yeah, and I'll, I'll call back in like four hours. We'll see. Uh, we'll see uh, where where you're at, where I'm at. You know, we'll try and we're trying to hook up a little bit. So I'm worried. I'm wondering if we come down here. The leak's getting pretty bad. You know, things are getting a little uh, drastic. I was wondering if, you, if there's any time you can come down here. Oh, buddy. Oh, man. There's just a. There's a major leak going on. I, I'm not making it out there today, man. Yeah, so we'll just check it tomorrow. You know, we'll check in. We'll see if you got. We'll see if um, see if you got anything going on. See if I got anything going on. Oh, we got a big leak. What's that? All right, this is Waterworks by Parker Brothers, which is a card laying game. On your turn, you're gonna be playing cards that are gonna make a network of pipes. And then once someone has put down a certain amount of cards, depending on the number of players, if you are able to, can put out your spigot here and if you were the first one to do this you win the game but that's not it there are certain cards that look like this that have a little leak in them you can go ahead and play it on someone else and then you have a couple of different choices you can use one of your little wrenches here and just fix it like that boom 
or you can take a card of the same type and put it back over that. There are also copper pipes and copper pipes can't ever get leaks. The first person to get their valve all the way out here to their faucet or spigot is the winner of the game. So that was Waterworks. You know what, this game was decent. It's kind of like Carcassonne. You're like, you know, you put it, the things down and they have to make the sense. The pipes gotta make sense. And you know what? I like it. Here's the thing, it's not the best, but it's not horrible. We're out of here, but before we go, we're gonna be at Gen Con. We are! And we're gonna be doing a Brothers Murph meetup thing at Moonshot Games. We want y'all to come down there Thursday night at 7.30 p.m. If you're in the Indianapolis area or you're at Gen Con, it's free. There's gonna be live music, some food. Restoration Games is gonna be there doing some giveaways and stuff. Please come out, it's gonna be so much fun. Uh, until next time, see you in the Leaky Pipes, man, when the Basilisk comes out in Harry Potter uh, 2. So you're going to Gen Con this year and you want some ideas on where to find RPGs. Hi, I'm Chris Renshaw and today that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you where on the dealer floor you can find some good RPGs. First mistake you're going to want to make is to avoid this area right in here. This is the Paizo booth. Well, Paizo is releasing a print version of their Pathfinder playtest book. So this booth here is going to be swamped with people. You're going to want to avoid that one too. Now granted, Fantasy Flight is also releasing some cool stuff with the L5R RPG, but it's one of those, is it worth spending time in line waiting for this? That's something only you can answer. If we head just north of the Fantasy Flight booth, that is where you'll find Chaosium. And Chaosium is famous for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. So you'll be able to find lots of good stuff there. Lastly, we're gonna look at aisle 2500, starting with 2563. This is Modifius Entertainment, who is famous for the Star Trek Adventures game, and they're coming out with the fifth edition Vampire the Masquerade game. Moving down from there, 2545 is a great place that I highly recommend for all of you. And that is the IDG and the Indie Game Developer Network. This is where a lot of people that can't afford to have a booth, a lot of small indie games will submit their games to this booth and they can be shown off here. So you're gonna see a wide range of RPGs. This is probably the best place to go if you're wanting to find a brand new RPG. Continuing down, booth 2519, I can't mention one of my favorite games, Monty Cook Games, Numenera, Cypher System, all those great games. They'll have probably the new releases of Numenera 2, Destiny, and Numenera Discovery there if you're wanting to check out the core new rule books. So there you go. There is a bunch of places for you to get started. This is hardly everything that you could do to find RPGs there. I could spend an hour going through the map here and I'd still miss probably some RPGs. In fact, that's the best part about Gen Con, is just wandering the halls and finding something that you didn't expect to. So in the meantime, make sure you check out the Boards and Swords podcast over wherever you're listening to podcasts. Follow me on social media and let me know where you're going to be, what you're playing at Gen Con. And in the meantime, I hope that all your hits are crits. <laughs> Hi, Mike Alicio from Solo Mode Games. Feudum is a game that's been getting a lot of buzz, but up until now it could not be played solo. Well, that all changes with the upcoming expansion, The Queen's Army. So I'd like to shine a Solo Mode spotlight on this expansion. Let's head on over to the table and take a look. Fancy playing Feudum solo? Look no further than The Queen's Army expansion. In the solo game, your opponent is the tyrannical queen and her army. While the game retains the same basic round structure, the solo game is played in two distinct phases. In the first phase, the queen and her army focus their attention on the behemoth figure which begins on the board. This figure represents the king, her former husband, who has been bewitched. The queen and her army will relentlessly pursue the bewitched king, trying to kill him for big, big points. In the second phase, the queen hops aboard her trusty steed Atticus and she and her army begin to focus directly on you, the player. She will attack your pawns and feedums directly and indirectly thwart your plans through gaining influence in guilds. The actions that the queen and her army take are determined through the use of an AI deck of cards that are put in five stacks. Like the regular game, the queen may on occasion take two actions in a row or may take a fifth action. While most of the AI actions correspond to the standard game actions, there are some differences. 
Also, the queen does not have to follow all of the same rules as the player. She's royalty, after all. The Queen's Army is a cleverly designed solo variant that is sure to entertain any fan of this game that wants to tackle it solo. It has a clear win-loss condition and presents a true challenge. Fans of heavy games and fans of solo games alike have something to look forward to with the release of Feudum, The Queen's Army. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day! Happy breakfast everybody! Today I'm going to talk to you about some games that I like but there's one element that links them all together that I hate doing. Now, it's not that I don't like teaching games. If it's a small, easy game, I can explain it to a group of new players absolutely fine. However, when it comes to games such as Scythe, Rising Sun, Twilight Imperium, well, I'm just not that confident in explaining rules. I might have played them enough to be able to tell you what happens, but can I do it in a coherent way that's a logical process? Probably not. I can get you all the information, but if I'm doing it in a jumbled way, it's not going to help anyone. So what I do is I send out the rule book, but also video explanations of the games from other people, not myself, that do it in a really good way. Because then people have the choice. They can either read the rules or play the video. Now, for me, I make it almost a necessity that people do that before we get a big game to the table. Say we're booking a day out for Twilight Imperium. I don't want to spend an hour trying to explain you the rules before the game starts, because it's already going to take up a lot of hours of the day. Coming with that information, I'm happy for people to ask questions, but if they don't know the rules, A, they're not that invested in playing such a big game, but B, if I make a mistake, then I really feel like I've maybe let their game experience down. So there's a few games that I really enjoy playing, but just can't teach. Are there any games that you find like that? Or have you found a specific way of getting around this problem of people sort of not learning before you come? Or are you like me and just tell people, read up and then you'll know how to play? Anyway, thanks for listening to me waffle on, and I'm Oliver East, signing out. So this week was a week where we saw a Kickstarter explode into Scamville. Um, and, you know, normally I might talk about this on my crowd surfing show, but I thought this was big enough to talk about here. And essentially what happened was there was a Kickstarter, uh, Overturn Shifting Sands, that... Uh, was doing extremely well, and lots of people were talking about it. I mentioned it on my last crowd surfing show, and you know we, uh, it, it looked amazing with miniatures and terrain and all that. Well, once people did some sleuthing, they found out that this this uh, Kickstarter was essentially uh, there. There was huge sections of the rule book that were copied directly from Massive Darkness from Simon, the logo of the company was actually the Firefox logo, just with a few things added to it, and just a lot of copying. And there was, you know, some waffling by the folks running the Kickstarter, but suddenly people started dropping out of the Kickstarter in droves. We saw uh, $100,000 lost and thousands of people are leaving this campaign, but not everybody did because not everyone is following along, right? Now, I, I feel like, honestly, I feel like some people when these things happen, are so greedy they don't care. Well, I, I saw this back when HeroQuest, uh, when, and it was very clear, everyone was notified that HeroQuest, that they did not have the rights to print it, and yet it was funding anyway, because people just really wanted HeroQuest. And sometimes people let their greed overcome their morals, which is why crime exists anyway, right? But, um, so I, I think some people are backing these pro the project anyway, because they're, you know, who cares? Yeah, sure, they're copying whatever, I want this, it looks amazing. But also a lot of people probably didn't back out of the project because they didn't know. I don't read every single comment on every single uh, Kickstarter project that I back. I back a Kickstarter project and then kind of forget about it. I read the updates. And so fortunately, Kickstarter stopped the project or suspended funding on it before it went out and all these people lost their money. But I... I I wonder about that, right? Because what do we do? And I, I want to jump, uh, not just in Kickstarter here, but in the industry in general, 
what do we do when we know something is wrong? So let's say you know um, publisher so-and-so is being immoral. This just happened. There's another big to-do if you haven't heard about it in regards to uh, Twixt from Alex Randolph, where somebody has uh, gotten the rights to do Twixt um, under what some people say would be shady circumstances and is going to reprint the game. And the relatives of Alex Randolph say, no, they have the rights to do that. And the uh, designer guild has basically sided with the Randolphs or the family of the Randolphs and so there's a big to-do about that, like who has the rights and should you back this company if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. We've seen other things where companies have been accused of copying or stealing or not delivering. We get a lot of emails sometimes where people will say, hey, this company did not deliver in their last three Kickstarters and yet they're starting another Kickstarter. You need to say something or this person's late and something. And I'm not sure that's our place, right? Especially when I don't have all the information, even with Overturn Shifting Sands, I'm very cautious to, I, I need to say, it looks like they were doing, I mean, the evidence is quite insurmountable, I believe, but at the same time, we're not 100% sure, and I'm very cautious to call people out publicly on a show, or publishers out. There are publishers out there that I think do shady and things, and I'm like, ah, I wouldn't do that, especially when I know a lot of stuff behind the scenes, I'm like, ah... And there may be publishers out there that you'll notice I don't even talk about very much because I don't really agree with a lot of their philosophies and how they do things. But I'm hesitant to call them out on videos like this because, well, first of all, I can get in trouble for, you know, uh, slandering them. Uh, and the I got to be careful in that regard. But also, I don't want to be the person in the front leading a witch hunt against someone who may actually be innocent or there are also many times maybe two sides in the stories. But let's say you, you do find a problem. So there's a couple ways that we deal with it. One, we deal with it behind the scenes. Like there's a publisher out there that I don't think anybody should work with. I don't make a video about that saying, do not work with publisher A. But if I run into a designer and that designer says, I'm thinking about working with publisher A, I can say, listen, I know this publisher, I've, I've dealt with them in different dealings and stuff in the past, and this is why I would not work with them. And that can be done, and it's not in a public way, and you're not making a big fuss online, where many times online stuff doesn't really do anything anyway, and that can have a difference. And so, what can you do? Now, in this case, with Overturn, there were people who went out and they warned folks. And I think that's fine, you know, especially if you're a backer and you find evidence. Evidence is useful. Evidence is better than saying, well, I heard that these guys are doing this. I heard is, is meaningless. But the people who said, listen, here's the rule book. Here's the other rule book. Here's where they're the same. Here's the Firefox logo. Here's the other logo. Here's where they're the same. That's much more useful. And that also persuades people. I look at that and I go, oh, yeah, wow, you're right. Someone coming to me and going, I'm telling you, these guys are doing this. I'm like, well, are, are you sure? Well, let's, I, I think so. That doesn't, that's not so helpful. So I'm not a huge fan of internet mob justice, right? I, I think it's, it, it, it can be a very dangerous thing. But at the same time, in this case, it also warned a lot of people. A lot of people went in with good intentions, not because they were mad because they didn't get their project in time, but because they honestly didn't want other people to lose money to these folks. And so this is kind of an interesting thing, and I like to get your guys' feedback on it in the comments. You know, what do you do in this case? So let's say you know something. Is it proper to shout out from the, you know, the house stops and the roots and Twitter and Facebook and say, do not work with this person, don't work with this person, don't work with this person? And sometimes it's not criminal. Sometimes it's, it could just be a difference of opinions. And we got to be careful sometimes where I, someone might do something. I go, I don't know if I'd do that. That's different than me saying that is blatantly illegal or wrong. In that case, I think we have a, more of a duty to say, hey, you know, you, you, you shouldn't do that. But I'm kind of the guy who thinks that behind the scenes stuff is much more effective than the trumpeting out. But maybe I'm wrong in that regard. Let me know what you think. How do you deal with these scammers? How do you deal with people who make questionably unethical decisions in gaming? What's up, everyone? I'm Danny. And I'm Derek. And this is... You Bet, Bet Your Bippy. Bippy. In this segment, we're going to give you some fun facts about a specific game so you can strike up a conversation at your next game night. And this week's game is... Ba -ba -ba. Patchwork. Ooh. Patchwork is a two-player-only game in which players are drafting fabric and buttons in hopes to put together the most beautiful quilt by the end of the game. 
Hey Derek. Hey. Did you know that the word quilt comes from the Latin colquita, which means mattress oh. or stuffed bag? Oh, really? You bet your bippy. <laughs> That's so much fun. You know that according to a study in 2014, that quilting is a $3.2 billion industry. Money, money, money. Money, money, money. You're right. You also, in that same study, it also said that 21 million people are quilting. Oh. Most of them being around the age of 62. Understandable. Mm. Kind of get keep that dexterity up. That's right. Well, did you know that quilting actually dates back to 3400 BC? I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah, but the oldest living quilt is the Tristan quilt, and it was made in the 14th century in Sicily. Oh, yeah. How wonderful. Did you know that the world's largest quilt to date right now is the AIDS Memorial quilt? and it weighs 52 tons. Holy cow. Is I it... don't know how many cars it is, but that is a lot of weight. That means that's a lot of fabric. So did you know any of these fun facts about quilts? Or do you have any fun facts about quilts that you'd like to share with us? Please do so in the comments below. <laughs> Make sure you guys follow us all over social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And we will see you next time. Happy breakfast, everybody. Happy breakfast. Get those quilt facts going. Go search them. <laughs> <laughs> Hello guys, I'm Carbo Rhino and welcome to Rhino Says Yes. Today I have a great exploration and tile placement game to show you, which is definitely a hidden gem. It's Lost Valley. Lost Valley, the Yukon Gold Rush 1896, is the second edition of Lost Valley and is a game for two to six players. During the course of the game, players must explore an ever-expanding valley in the hopes of discovering gold, forests for timber, or a fishing spot along the river for some food. The map is modular, so it's different every time you play. In your turn, you can move and explore, do an action, and trade goods in the trading post, and you can use the whiskey to gain one extra action. The actions you can do involve collecting materials like fish or cutting down trees or hunting, and you can also dig for gold and build works. If you do works that other players can benefit from as well, you gain XP, and every two XP you can get a special skill. River gold is easier to wash and collect, but other areas you have to connect with water first or, in the case of the mountain gold, you first need to build a mine or get some dynamite. You of course need tools in your journey to get gold, but you also need gold itself so that you can exchange it for items and gear to help you reach your goal more effectively. You also have to make sure you have enough space in your backpack and your carts for the stuff you absolutely need. There are some treasure maps you can put together and find the right spot, which give you extra gold. You need 10 gold tokens to trigger the end of the game, or when the land tiles end, you keep playing until the river freezes. The player with the most gold nuggets wins the game. I really enjoy playing this game because it actually feels like I'm on a fishing trip. The game allows you to explore more and more gradually, there is coziness in the gameplay and in the player interaction, and excitement in discovering new things. The mechanics are very interesting and for sure will keep you engaged all the way through. Unfortunately, you have to bear the rulebook and the graphic design that are not great, but it's worth doing so because the game itself is great. So Rhino says, yes to Lost Valley, you should definitely give it a try. Welcome to The Pitch. Hi everyone. We are in Paris. Yeah, and we're at oh, uh, Marseille. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful Notre Dame. It's not Marseille. I'm pretty sure it's not Marseille. It's Paris. <laughs> Look at that. Beautiful Notre Dame. Just Saint Michel. I just learned. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, take a look at that. All the memories we will be taking home and ah, we maybe pick up a souvenir or two. So we are having a little family vacation. We are in Paris on the Rue Saint André des Arts and uh, there's a board game store here. So I'm gonna try and convince Ilka to, to let me buy Notre Dame. The store is called Variante. Ilka. Yes. This is the perfect souvenir. Okay. It's a Stefan Feld game. You love Castles of Burgundy. Mm -hmm. Let me ask something first. Bonjour. <laughs> c'est seulement en uh, français? Ah non, c'est aussi en anglais, en allemand, mais je crois qu'il y a d'autres langues. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm sorry, it's only in French. Only in French. Ah, dommage. Oh well, small victories, I guess. Bonjour. I'm Randy. I'm Alan. Welcome to Games Just Played. This is uh, part two of our special, how we pick games that we're going to buy. The second thing I look at in games is what the weight rating is. Board Game Geek, again to the rescue, they have a user voted on ranking system. Anywhere from one to five, five being the heaviest. Uh, most of our games in our collection are a 1.75 yeah. to one to what, 3.25. Three um, we have specific. some heavier games that are uh, almost fours. Uh, but we typically stay in that mid yeah. mid to heavyweight range. Yeah, definitely. I think the heaviest one we have is like Caverna and Great Western. Trip, Those would be the two like heaviest a, that we yeah, have. Yeah, guideline. Um, before I mentioned aesthetics is important for me, and it, it is. Um, also components. Um, I know not everybody has one, but we have a 3D printer, and if he's able to reprint like pink components for me, I'm all about it. Yep, every game that we didn't have pink components on, I went through and I, I reprinted all the pieces for her Pretty so that sweet. she'd have yeah. her pink. Um, also, I do not like using cardboard coins. And I get it that you just, that's like the main kind yeah. of coin that there is, but yeah. we've been using scythe coins for like the longest time. The metal coins from scythe, it's the yeah. clinking and the feel and the weight is just, uh, oh, baby. It's adds so, so much to games. I don't know why, but yeah. It does. I love the metal coins. So I don't, for me, those are important things. <laughs> Last thing is we buy a lot of expansions for games. We have something like 50 or 60 expansions of our 160 or so game collection. Yeah. Um, like 220 or so total, that would be. Uh, I prefer expansions because I like to be able to play a single game more mm -hmm. and more times versus playing a ton of games uh, just a, once or twice. Yeah, definitely. There. We love just adding on to a game that we already have and we already love. So, expansions. Yep. And the picture of the day is of Hamilton Pool in Texas. It was a great trip that we went down to for my cousin's wedding. Yeah, it was awesome. We'll see you next time My Games Just Played. I'm Ellen. I'm Randy. Today I'm reviewing Rising Sun by the man himself, Eric Lang. I'm Mark Maya. Welcome to Board Game Coffee, the Espresso Edition. Rising Sun is a three to five player game about war, politics, and screwing over those closest to you. First thing you're going to notice about Rising Sun is how absolutely gorgeous this game is. The artistic representation of feudal Japan is handled masterfully in all aspects of Rising Sun. These little mandate cards, the art on your clan screen, these little coin things, and this overly large, although beautifully illustrated, game board. And the minis are awesome. Alright, enough about the art, let's get to the gameplay. The rule book scared me a little. I mean, learning a new game is challenging enough. But learning a new game and getting tossed terms like Bushy, Shinto, Oni, and Kami. What? It was all very intimidating. And the term political mandate, which is a key component to this game, had me wondering what the hell am I getting myself into? I'm not smart enough to deal in politics. I get all my political know-how from Trump tweets. But in all seriousness, there's nothing all too complicated in Rising Sun. It's all theatrical window dressing. There's also a war phase that takes place after all the political mandating. In the war phase, players determine their actions on the battlefield via blind bidding, which introduces a really well-balanced and fun bluffing mechanic. Now, normally I don't like bidding games, but I found the use of it in Rising Sun a lot of fun. But you want to know what the most funnest part of Rising Sun is? Alliances. I absolutely love the alliance mechanic. It's the best way I've found to screw over your friends and genuinely enjoy it. Forming an alliance with one friend against a previous friend is a lot of fun. The whole alliance thing brings with it a negotiation aspect which keeps the entire group engaged the whole time. It's filled with underhanded deal making, broken promises, and a little backstabbing. Or maybe that was just my group. I'm starting to think I need better friends. Maybe they do. Anyways, Rising Sun is absolutely amazing. My number one game this year so far. And if you can buy it, I suggest you do so. You won't be disappointed. Hey everybody, it's Christina from Girls Game Shelf. I have had the worst luck lately. I've had a back injury, I now have a foot injury, and this has all amounted to me spending just a lot of time laid up in bed. It's not exactly a bad thing because as the mother of three very tiny, tiny, tiny humans, it gives me some really lovely time to just kind of kick back and play games. But playing games in bed is kind of tricky sometimes. So here's the criteria that worked for me. 
First and foremost, and maybe most obviously, are games that don't take up a lot of real estate. You would think that this means card games, right? Because cards are so compact. However, so many of the games that I love that are card games use the cards as kind of like a modular board, or you need to have them spread out in a certain formation. And that's all really difficult if your playing surface is a blanket. I played a lot of Arcane Academy because I love that game, and because even though there are some cards involved, it's pretty manageable. I also played a lot of tack, because those pieces are so chunky, you don't really worry about them tipping over. And also, they're all contained on their own board, which leads me to my next point. Any game that has its own stable playing surface is really very good. For example, I played a lot of Sagrada, and you wouldn't think that a dice rolling game would be a good choice, but with Sagrada, those mats have those tiny little grooves where the dice just kind of nestle in so nicely, and they don't roll around a lot. And you only roll your dice at the top of each round anyways. Plus, I'd been waiting to play Sagrada for like a year and a half, so even if it didn't play well in bed, I was going to play it. But it worked well. Finally, books that are games are getting so popular, and I'm so glad about that. I played a lot of Journal 29, which is a book full of puzzles, and you have to solve one in order to get the key from a special website to be able to solve the next puzzle. So games like Journal 29 and the graphic novels from Van Ryder Games and uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, they're all great because you can also play them solo, which is a real perk if you're laid up in bed because you spend some time alone there. That's it for me, but I'm still going to be laid up in bed for a while with this ankle, so if you have any suggestions, please let me know, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Hello, breakfasters. Hi, Tom. My name is Blaine from Blaine's Games. I'm quite grateful to the Dice Tower. In fact, I own many of the games behind me because of Tom and the Dice Tower's reviews or news reports. But when it comes to his view on some small box games, Tom's just wrong. Tom, I've heard you complain about some tiny games. They aren't very epic, and you've said others should have been bigger. I'm going to make three points in this video in hopes that you'll reconsider this position. Point number one. As a person with uh, mobility challenges, there are practical limits to what I can comfortably carry around with me. I feel like this is the point where I should be doing my Tuscan Raider impersonation. <laughs> I love mechs versus minions, but I'm not carrying this anywhere. Just no. I love Dinosaur Island, but what is this thing weigh? 20 pounds? And some perfectly wonderful games are just too bulky to travel. Point number two, this is Shadowrun Crossfire. No, really, I know this is the expansion box, but I fit the base game inside this box. How many big box games come with too much cardboard insert and too much air? This is Tiny Epic Galaxies. This game almost doesn't fit in the box it came in. That's true for a lot of the games in this line. It's a lot of game in a little box, both in components and gameplay. Which brings me to my final point. This bag, point number three. I can fill a bag that's easy to tote around with a great assortment of fulfilling and immersive gameplay. Like exploring the galaxy and racing to be the first to colonize the richest worlds. Delving into a dungeon where the characters can level up between quests, improving their abilities over the length of a campaign. Strategizing over pocket-sized 4X game that only takes 45 minutes to play or less. Flying to have the best 18th century French estate. Managing our trucks to ship goods, the most goods on the open road. Enjoying a deductive cat and mouse game between Sherlock Holmes and Jack the Ripper. Competing in a grand table hogging Zelda like quest. Laughing at my friend's challenge to dexterity. 
exploring a nearly epic worker placement game set in a tiny harbor. Hunting and being hunted by deadly aliens on a mysterious spaceship. Engaging in a duel between two wizards. Enjoying a resource management engine building game with a campaign mode. Running a minty fresh worker placement game for one to four players. Playing a real time card game about serving restaurant customers in a restaurant. Enjoying a classic auction game about trading real estate. Or enjoying a real time two player dice chucker that fits in your pocket. Tom, that's an incredible array of robust, immersive gaming experience to pack in one bag. And it wouldn't be possible if there weren't so many great little games. So, to sum up, Tom, I hope you consider these points in the future. These small box games, tiny though they are, fill a need. With over a thousand games launching each year, there certainly is a place for them. Hopefully, I'll never again hear you say, Why is it tiny? Thanks, and enjoy your breakfast, everyone. All right, well, you're, you are going to hear me say that again, but I, I want to point out a couple things. First of all, I do not think little games are bad. Like you pointed out, you can have a ton of little games in a bag, and I have tons of little games around here that I really like. And uh, like Santo Domingo, I just uh, reviewed that this past week. I think that's a great little game. I just think a little game should be a little game. And like, for example, Mint Delivery, or I'm sorry, Mint Works is a tiny little game that I actually like. And it works as a tiny game and it's easy to carry around. But just as you say that a bigger game is heavy and harder to carry around for a lot of people, and that's certainly a valid point. So you could also say that a game that's little and has tiny print and everything is harder for people with bad eyesight. I'm not sure that I can say that a someone who has a problem, a disability in regards to a certain game, maybe I have a hard time, um, you know, with, I have a shaky hand, right? So I, I shouldn't talk about dexterity games. No, I, I, I think sometimes we just have to work within our limitations. And I also might say that a bag of little games like that, and then you, in another bag you have Seventh Continent, I might want to play the Seventh Continent more than all those other little games put together. Maybe. But... The only time where I say this, and you mentioned this with the Tiny Epic Games in particular, and not every Tiny Epic Game is this way, but I feel like the Tiny Epic Games could have been a bigger game. Instead of squinting and moving tiny little pieces, I'd prefer it to be a little bit bigger on the table. I'm not asking it for it to be mechs versus minion size. I'm asking for it to be Carcassonne size or Ticket to Ride size, a little bit bigger. I don't say it very often, but I probably will continue to say it about different games. Of course, the Tiny Epic people kind of smacked me upside the head then when I came out with Heroes Land, Air, and Sea, since that game is gigantic. I understand your point, and I certainly think we should talk about little games, which is why we review a ton of them on this channel. But I still do like my big games also. Folks, that's the end of another Board Game Breakfast. If you have a Tom is Wrong segment, definitely send it in. Gives, here's your chance to tell the world what I do wrong or say wrong. I really felt like I would be getting thousands of submissions. Um, but anyhow, we love to hear back from you, of course. Check out our forums. Talk to us on our Facebook group. Until next time, though, I'm Tom Bassett. You've been watching Board Thanks Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Day Breakfast. Day. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.